Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So the, the good news is that we have emerging options uh, for treatment of metastatic pancreas cancer and, and now have the luxury of, of choice uh, for some patients, which wasn't an option in, in previous years. And two big trials have sort of defined the current uh, standards in metastatic disease. Uh, the first one that was uh, presented was the ACORD, the PRODIGE study, which was a randomized trial looking at fulfirinox uh, compared to gemcitabine in ECOG 0 to 1 patients. This trial was conducted in France at academic centers mostly. And this study had a number of distinctions, not least the first of all that it closed at its interim analysis because of positivity, not futility in pancreas cancer. And all of the endpoints were significant in terms of improved uh, overall survival, 11 plus months in the fulfirinox arm compared to uh, six and a half in the gemcitabine treated arm, uh, corresponding improvement in progression free survival and overall survival, and uh, sorry, and tumor response. So consistent uh, theme. You know, this has to be balanced with the fact that the regimen does have some inherent toxicities, all of which you might expect from the uh, from the drugs. So GI toxicity, malosuppression, infection, uh, neuropathy, fatigue, uh, etc. And that has led to uh, it being both embraced and modified to try and preserve the efficacy signal, but also to ameliorate some of the toxicity, and we'll come back to that. So the other major study is the IMPACT uh, trial, uh, more recent data, and this was a large phase three stu study of over 800 patients uh, receiving gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel again with the reference arm being gemcitabine. And this was conducted in North America, but also uh, across Europe, uh, parts of Asia, and uh, even uh, Eastern Europe. And this study was also positive and consistently so in terms of improved uh, median overall survival, improved uh, progression-free survival, and improved tumor response. The study was conducted in a slightly different patient population, and, and this, I think, influences the results is in that there was no limit in terms of older age, in contrast to uh, the Fulferinox trial, where the upper age limit was 76. And his study included KPS 70 uh, uh, patients, so some ECOG 2 patients. And we said the Fulferinox study was conducted in ECOG 0 to 1. And we know patient selection has a significant impact in terms of outcome. So the median overall survival was eight and a half months on the gemcitabine and apactitaxel arm. The control arm uh, fared fairly similarly in, in both, uh, both studies. So that leaves us uh, with a choice, and, and one might take the superficial perspective that based on median survivals, there's a clear winner, but I, I think it's not as, as straightforward as, as that. And uh, there are some practical logistic issues uh, along with patient preferences as to why one approach might be preferable. And this is sort of a discussion we have every day is, you know, a weekly uh, uh, treatment uh, versus uh, the need for a Mediport and an infusion schedule, uh, whether alopecia is a concern uh, for a patient, and they can uh, those choices can result in selecting uh, one approach versus another. And this is also an area of uh, active research, trying to understand if there are markers that can be used uh, to guide one particular uh, approach versus another. And our group has looked at uh, circulating tumor and invasive cells uh, using a pharmacogenomic model in collaboration uh, with colleagues at Stonerbrook and uh, Cell Therapeutics uh, to see if we can define uh, a profile of sensitivity versus resistance uh, for each of these regimens. And you know, one day an approach such as that could could be helpful in terms of guiding selection. But I would say right now that the, the the practical issues uh, come down to um, patient preference, discussion of the toxicity profiles, and um, some, to some extent, the degree of supportive care uh, afterwards can have an influence. The other, I'd say, noticeable development in the field is with the emergence of gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. That's been identified now as a reference regimen for good performance status patients in metastatic disease. And it certainly provides 
a clearer regulatory path uh, for development in terms of integration of new agents. So that particular combination has been, um, on that basis, arguably an easier platform for new drug additions. And there are a whole series now of uh, phase 1B and randomized phase 2 trials adding novel agents to gemcitabine and apaclitaxel. It's a little harder to do that because of overlapping toxicities uh, for fulfirinox. And as yet, in, in North America, we have single institution and a good number of single institution experiences. But we don't have a cooperative group experience with fulfirinox in, in North America uh, to, to understand how it fares, because I think that's a good test, too, uh, of, of a regimen across a broader uh, swath of patients. There is some sense that the side effect profile for the gemcitabine and apaclitaxel is more favorable than the fulfirinox regimen. For that reason, the fulfirinox regimen probably is, is best fit for uh, the most uh, uh, the most fit patients, uh, the younger patients, the patients who have very favorable ECOG performance status. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that uh, the fulfirinox regimen was tested only in. In, in, in centers within one country, whereas the MPAC trial was done uh, throughout the world. It was a, a global trial. So, so basically, the MPAC trial has a good track record in terms of going across communities, different practices, and all that. And with that, we still uh, saw a, a very good improvement in survival, um, in, again, relative to this disease where we had many negative studies in the past. The efficacy, uh, in my opinion, is uh, is comparable if you take everything into account. So basically, uh, if you t if you look at the, for example, MPAC trial, there was no upper age limit, whereas in the Fulfrenox trial, uh, the upper age limit was uh, mid 70s. So uh, so basically, um, the the effect of the treatments, it, it, if you compare both studies, they're they're pretty much similar if we really take into account the populations that they were tested. Uh, there's obviously concern when we uh, when we when we use these regimens in patients who have abnormal liver function tests, and that applies to both uh, regimens because, uh, the for example, the aronotecan is cleared by the liver, dependent on it, and and, and even the napaclitaxel is cleared by the liver. So these are limitations on patients who. Uh, who uh, really we can use these treatments. Now, fortunately, uh, most of the patients will not have that problem, but with a disease where we use, for example, stents to, uh, uh, biliary stents to, uh, to deal with the biliary obstruction and, and liver dysfunction can be uh, a recurring problem in a, in a very small uh, segment of patients, these treatments might be uh, needed to be given with a lot of caution and, and experience by oncologists. But the majority of the time, uh, those treatments can be given um, to, to patients uh, and, and you follow the guidelines and follow the, uh, uh, what is really out there in terms of how to deal with side effects, dose reduction, et cetera, I think uh, oncologists can deal with, with both uh, regimens in, in, a, in a good way. Patients who progress on uh, any of those regimens, uh, we apply the principles of oncology. You go for a, a, another drug or combination that the patient hasn't uh, been exposed to because it's based on uh, the tumor cells becoming resistant to the uh, treatment. However, sometimes we have to change treatment not only because of uh, tumor resistance, but also because uh, the patient is not being able to tolerate the therapy. It happens more with the Fulfrenox regimen where there are patients who will not be able to tolerate the treatment because of, uh, for example, the gastrointestinal side effects. The GI symptoms can be uh, uh, those limiting and sometimes they can be prohibitive for us to continue uh, with it, with the treatment as is, especially with the use of iron tecan. There are patients who, uh, I, and I routinely check the UGT1A1 genotype, and there are patients with uh, the Gilbert syndrome, for example, that phenotype. Those patients will not be able to tolerate uh, the full dose of iron tecan, and sometimes even giving them half dose is a struggle. So there are patients who may not fit into one or the other, but unfortunately, most of the time, we know that after we start the treatment and the patient is not tolerating it well. If the patient has to give up a regimen because of drug resistance or they're intolerant to it, if they start with fulfrenox, then we will switch to gemcitabine, napaclitaxel. So if we start with the gemcitabine, napaclitaxel, 
Uh, and in the second line, not all patients we can give them fulfrenox. In fact, it will be more that we give Folfox regimen or Zelox regimen than we do the fulfrenox. Because in the second line, for some reason, especially in my practice, I, I cannot give the iron ticket to the majority of the patients, so I end up using only the oxaloplatin phylofilucovorin, which is the Folfox regimen. And there is evidence in the literature that uh, the combination of a fluoroprimidine like fibrofluorouracil oxaloplatin is better than using fo uh, fluoroprimidine uh, alone, so we follow that sort of uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, at this time, there are other drugs that are coming along in the second line and, and, and maybe subsequent lines of treatment. There is ruxolotinib, which is a, a JAK stat inhibitor that is uh, currently in phase three trials with some interesting results in the in the pilot uh, uh, phase two trials. But we still have to wait for the results. Uh, that's the phase three trial is still ongoing. There is liposomal iron tecan, uh, which has been um, tested in a phase three trial and showed some interesting results. And again, that will be an interesting addition to, uh, to our armamentarium in treating patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, we have to really be careful with that drug because uh, forfrenox also has iron tecan, and patients who fail forfrenox, I don't know how responsive they will be to a second line treatment that has a iron tecan, or, despite the fact it's a liposomal, but still it's the same drug. And one of the key things about talking about the treatment, the systemic therapy of, uh, of pancreatic adenocarcinoma is the, is the issue of clinical trials. We know that these treatments, although they have made a, an impact uh, and they have been better than having gemcitabine as a single agent, but still the benefit is very, very modest and the patients, the majority of the patients will experience early progression of the disease, therefore we need new drugs. And patients who have good performance status patients have good organ function. They, these are patients who still have to be considered for, clin uh, for a clinical trial as the first option, in my opinion. And they should have access to a, 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 a cancer center that offers clinical trials because I think it's important for us to do that. And those clinical trials are not really giving them a placebo. These clinical trials are, in the vast majority of the time, in fact, always, they are based on having the standard treatment. For example, if you start with frontline treatment, and you're going to give gemcitabine nap paclitaxel. In a clinical trial, it will be like you start with gemcitabine nap paclitaxel plus drug X, or it could be drug X or placebo, but at the end of the day, they're going to get the active um, combination, but also they have the opportunity to be on a newer drug, which might, which might be uh, offering additional benefit. Well, we're involved with uh, several trials in our institution, and, and there are uh, a number of frontline, second-line uh, treatments. There's the uh, pegylated hyaluronidase, which is uh, a, a, a drug that uh, breaks down the stroma, uh, which, which we think is a barrier to the, to the uh, delivery of the chemotherapy. That drug is now being combined with gemcitabine and napaclitaxel in a randomized phase two trial, and the, the Southwest Oncology Group is uh, testing the drug in combination with Folfrenox regimen. That drug, based on the preclinical evidence, uh, it, it looks interesting, but again, unless we do the clinical trials, we will not know if that's going to be a drug that is going to be uh, part of the standard treatment. So that will be a few years before we, we know that. So that's an, an interesting compound. There's a lot of buzz about it.